Um, tonight's lecture is the first, as far as I know, the first official lecture uh, of the Academy Spring Lecture Series. Um, and you can um, please see our website for the full lineup of um, public lectures this spring. This evening's lecture uh, and the, the three-day workshop for the 3D students that's connected with it um, was made possible by support from Knoll International. So first I'd like to uh, thank them for their support. Tonight we are joined by Alex Mustanin and Benjamin Porto from the architectural group Snarkitecture. Snarkitecture is a collaborative and experimental practice operating in the territories between art and architecture. The name is drawn from Lewis Carroll's The Hunting of the Snark, a poem describing, quote, an uh, impossible voyage of an improbable crew to find an inconceivable creature. Snarkitecture investigates the unknown within architecture by manipulating and reinterpreting exi existing materials, structures, and programs to, to spectacular effect. Exploring the boundaries of disciplines, the studio uh, designs permanent architectural scale projects and functional objects with new and imaginative uh, purposes. Snarkitecture's approach focuses on the viewer's experience and memory, creating moments of wonder and interaction that allow people to engage directly with their surrounding environment. By transforming the familiar into the, to the extraordinary, Snarkitecture uh, makes architecture perform the unexpected. Snarkitecture uh, co-founders uh, Daniel Arshman and Alex Mustanen um, met in 2000 at Cooper Union in New York, um, where they shared a mutual interest in the intersection of art and architecture. In 2008, they established um, their, their um, office, uh, and as their commissions uh, evolve in breadth and, and scope, the um, studio has grown. Senior associate Benjamin Porto, um, who has a, a master's of architecture from Columbia, um, joined the group in 2014 uh, to help oversee the expanding studio uh, collaborate, collaborating in Greenpoint, Brooklyn. Um, we are in the middle of a three-day workshop um, in which students were asked to find a site on campus uh, and design an object that would um, enhance the experience of the site. And that's a very general description of the workshop, but gives you the, the gist of it. Um, so I'd like to uh, thank both of our guests um, for making the trip here and their generosity in sharing their time and ideas with us. Uh, please help me to welcome Alex Mustanin and Ben Porto. Uh, and I'm Ben. Um, first, we'd like to thank Scott and the, the 3D studio for having us here. Um, so far, it's been really exciting. Um, and uh, thank you to Cranbrook. And we'll just go through you know, what we're up to, what the studio's been doing um, the past few years, both in architecture scale and um, kind of smaller scale and kind of all the in-between. Um, but after that, we'd really like to have you know, a, a nice conversation with all the people who have come and kind of open this up to just more of a dialogue. So. We'll try to keep it short. Um, we'd like to start with this image, uh, which is, sorry, uh, a woodcut from Lewis Carroll's The Hunting of the Snark, which as Scott mentioned, is the namesake of our practice, um, rhymes with architecture. Uh, this is the ocean chart that the characters in the book are using on their journey to find the snark. Um, so the snark for Lewis Carroll is this kind of invented unknown and for us, the practice is the same, the search for the unknown within architecture. Um, and as he said, which uh, is sort of a guiding principle for us is, um, it's just easier to read it. Um, the poem describes this impossible voyage of an improbable crew to find an inconceivable creature. So this is sort of a guiding principle for us, something that we think about in the studio. Um, and that search and the sort of playfulness of Carol are both things that inform what our practice is up to. Um, our studio is in Greenpoint in Brooklyn. Um, the 
the practice is a very sort of, uh, I would say, collaborative and studio-based practice. Um, Daniel, and I, Daniel's the, to my left there, um, started the practice in 2008, as Scott mentioned, um, and it's kind of grown to incorporate mostly architects, but some other um, disciplines, designers, and artists as well. Um, and the studio is definitely a place of activity. It's also shared with Daniel's art practice. So in addition to our collaboration together um, with our studio, Daniel also maintains his own fine art practice under his name. And the two studios share a space. So it's a very kind of active, cross-pollinated, um, busy, productive, experimental environment. Um, give us a super short background on sort of how Daniel and I met and how the studio came to be and the practice came to be, and then we'll kind of launch into the recent work. Um, we both went to school at Cooper Union in New York a little bit after this photo was taken, but Daniel went to the art school and I went to the architecture school. So there's this sort of um, immediately uh, in the very like uh, model of what Cooper Union is trying to promote is the sort of seed of our practice. Um, we had studios one floor apart. I was on the third floor here and he was on the fourth floor. Um, as a sculptor. After graduating, uh, so we were friends during school, and after graduating, Daniel was commissioned. He was making work already sort of informed by architecture and interested in architecture. And he was commissioned by Dior, uh, by Hedy Thelman, to create this artwork that was going to be a permanent installation uh, at this new Dior home store that was being built in LA. He made the proposal. Oh, sorry, yeah, better? Okay. Um, he made the proposal, um, the client loved it. Uh, this was basically uh, the initial concept and they said, this is great, but uh, it won't work. You can never build it and you can't do it. Uh, so he asked me to come on board as a consultant and we spent the next kind of nine months basically making this project which looks relatively simple. It's basically this uh, sort of wall glacial erosion and this mirror piece. Um, they're both in a very small dressing room, but it took uh, quite some time to sort of make this work with uh, three architects and uh, three contractors and the client and all of these other the, uh, building authorities and all of the other sort of people involved in the project. Um, and during this sort of nine months uh, was the initial discussions of what would a kind of sustained collaborative practice look like. Uh, the difference between a kind of a one-off uh, collaboration or consultant uh, kind of role and looking more at over a, s a longer period of time and an in-depth investigation, um, what are the spaces that we can sort of discover uh, and investigate between art and architecture and how can we push these two disciplines um, toward one another and so that's what we started in 2008. Um, the practice has since kind of formed itself into these two distinct but parallel and related paths, uh, one of which is architectural scale work and the other of which is object scale work. And under both of those umbrellas, there's uh, a relative uh, breadth in the amount of, uh, in the range of projects we're taking on. Uh, everything in architectural scale from uh, full scale uh, structures to interiors to stage design to public art, uh, to installation, and under the object side is a similar kind of range from the smallest scale sort of accessory to larger scale sort of furniture pieces. Um, there's a few goals that we have that um, sort of inform uh, the direction of the research and sort of production that we're engaging in. Um, and this is really the most elemental, which is this idea about making architecture perform the unexpected. Um, taking the world around us, this architecture that is familiar to us, and finding sites within it to uh, manipulate and uh, alter for these sort of new and imaginative purposes. Um, and sometimes it's not architecture. So this is a table. Um, this is actually one of the first kind of non-large scale pieces we did, first freestanding object that we made. And it's still in the center of our studio. It was sort of made out of necessity. Um, and it's both a conference table, a ping pong table, um, but I think it's a simple object, but it sort of says a lot about what we're interested in. So in this case, this sort of very rectilinear, uh, for us, architectural volume of this rectangular table uh, with this sort of irrational, completely illogical underside, uh, which is actually hidden. So unless you actually step back and take a look at it or you reach your hands under the table while you're sitting at it, it's completely concealed. Um, and it's also something that is functions as a ping pong table, a space of play and interaction, uh, but also functions without that as a more serious sort of uh, work uh, discussion table. And this is a series of pieces that are 
based on a very similar premise, which is uh, these are shelves uh, that are using the similar logic of this kind of very uh, clean architectural datum, this horizontal surface that provides function uh, within this otherwise kind of uh, craggy, excavated environment. Um, we're going to start with a couple older projects and then kind of go into these other things, but they're basically grouped under these sort of uh, thematics of uh, the first one being architecture performing the unexpected. Uh, this was a project that we were commissioned for by Storefront for Art and Architecture in New York. Um, it was the first project that Ava Frank, the director there, was um, asked to do, or she asked us to do. And uh, I don't think she quite expected us to do what we did, but uh, we basically proposed uh, taking this gallery, which you see here. This is kind of an initial series of studies um, about excavation. So about the idea about creating space through removal uh, and uh, the excavation of a void. So instead of thinking about architecture um, as sort of a series of assembled objects, uh, construction assemblies, going back to this very primitive idea of uh, forming space and space for habitation uh, by the removal of uh, solid material. This is the plan of storefront. Uh, so what we proposed to do was completely fill the space, um, save for this kind of viewing area at the front. And not just uh, like a few pieces here and there, but fill it completely solid. Uh, it's about 100 feet long. Uh, and so what we did was we filled it with this uh, architectural foam, a very dense EPS foam. These are sort of series of studies about these ideas about kind of cutting into that volume. And so this is the first day. Uh, behind this is about 70 feet of solid EPS foam. And this is how it started. So it took about a month, uh, and during the month, the gallery was open. People could come in, and if you've been to Storefront or familiar with the space, these sort of rotating panels that face onto Kenmare Street allow you to kind of glimpse in. And so as we moved back further into the volume, we sort of reached the facade in these critical moments, creating this sort of ant, ant farm kind of effect, uh, a little bit of an interaction between viewer and performer, um, performer in this case being Daniel and our studio team excavating this thing over the course of several months, or sorry, several weeks. So this is more or less the end result. Uh, for us, it wasn't something that was ever really finished, but on the last day of the project, we invited uh, the public uh, to come in and sort of experience this. Um, big hit with kids. Um, and there were all these sort of um, less intentional results. One was the sort of, uh, it, insulating effect of the foam, which was literally insulation. So this sort of warmth and uh, acoustic qualities uh, of being in a very cold space next to a very busy street. Uh, the installation uh, for DIG was created this sort of uh, refuge or a space of warmth that really sort of uh, invited people to kind of sit and hang out. And there's Ava in the middle. And this is a sort of view onto the street um, this idea about excavation and sort of breaking things uh, has sort of continued in a few different directions for us. Um, this is just another example of a uh, furniture piece that we did for Volume Gallery a few years ago. Uh, this is a cabinet that uh, is called Break. When peop most people see this and uh, have a sort of reaction of this is a nice piece, I like it, but I really need something that actually works or that I can use. Um, and it does, so you open the doors, the shelves are adjustable. Uh, the top is designed to, so that a glass or a bottle that's set on top of it is gonna just actually stay perfectly at rest while sort of suggesting some instability. Uh, jumping back up to more of an architecture scale, uh, Drift is the project we did. It's the entrance pavilion to Design Miami. Um, it was their pavilion for the Art Basel and 2012. Um, and performing the unexpected in this case, um, what we really started getting interested in is the tent as an architectural volume and material. So what we started playing with is that kind of ubiquitous white tent, um, kind of Tyvek uh, material, vinyl material. Um, and also just the iconic shape of tent, of the kind of wedding tent, art tent. Um, so we kind of took that as our starting point, as our block. And playing with that shape and what makes that volume, we kind of broke it down into what ended up being 500 um, inflated tubes. 
And starting as a volume, we start to kind of push and pull with this piece so it kind of keeps, in one way in plan, it keeps its shape but starts to you know, not quite excavate, but in this, you know, pushing and pulling makes these different cavernous spaces and, you know, along the way, pulling some out, um, create these kind of oculuses and start framing views uh, from the entrance and back into the city. And we still used the actual tent structure. So these inflated tubes, um, we fit into and kind of latched onto um, just one more piece of the same kind of tent structure. Um, sorry, back on the mic here. Um, how tall were all these? Like 15 feet tall? Uh, yeah, like up to 20 feet tall. 20 feet tall and like about three foot diameter. Um, this is our install day here. They're all kind of just latched on, um, which gave us a kind of flexibility to you know, plan for this, but also maneuver as we kind of get into the actual space. And so there's a bit of like a, a freedom there. One of the things we were looking at when we were making this was this kind of pin screen, uh, this toy from, I think it was popularized in the 80s, but the, you know, you push your hand into it and it kind of creates this um, positive impression above. So for us, it was this kind of cavern that could be inhabited and sort of create this um, uh, gateway below. And then from a distance, from across the parking lot where Art Basel was, this kind of mountainous form that marked the sort of a site of creativity, the site of the entrance to this uh, design land. I mean, at that point also, um, we'll get to a view where you can see it from a little further out that these things are all inflated, but still create this like really heavy volume, which I think is just such a wonderful thing to get such solid stuff hanging up. Um, and these also designed, these furniture pieces um, drooped around the spot. Um, Um, which is really wonderful that we can get people kind of interacting with, you know, some more of these, these volumes, these tubes in the space. Um, and you can see here the heights of these things that people can kind of get up and, and you can give one of our inflated tubes a hug. We did lose one along the way. Um, during install, one tube got loose and kind of shot up like a, you know, circus uh, balloon animal, but. We found it. We found it. Um, one of the more interesting things about this, I mean, it's a, a lot of the work that we've done um, to about a year ago is very temporary in nature. Um, this was a project that took about a year to create, but took about uh, six days to, uh, well, a little bit more than that, including the install, but it wasn't up for much longer. Uh, but at the same time, it's a project that, uh, because of its site and location uh, and uh, function, is completely, you know, it's something that we had to work with structural engineers and consulting architects and obviously the client and some other building authorities. But what was amazing to me about this is the entire thing is uh, it's made from st using structural Velcro. So it's actually like structurally calculated uh, Velcro connections to the tent. Um, this is like this kind of amazing hidden view that I saw. Uh, Someone posted this on Instagram and I couldn't find where it was. And so we spent like sev a couple hours like wandering around the neighborhood trying to find this moment and it's hidden in this botanical garden a couple blocks away. Um, the other actually, fa my favorite moment from this entire project actually was after the installation. I think everybody had gone home from Miami and I got this video from, uh, if anybody knows Martin de Kuller, the Belgian designer. And he had sent me a video of he and his friends had taken these, uh, like they stole a, a couple of them and brought them to the beach. And they were literally like riding around on them and then doing the kind of the blob move where you jump on it when it's half filled and it launches you into the air. Um, so I was hoping that maybe more people would take these, but they're a little bit bulky. Um, this is a table. Uh, it's made from uh, white glass reinforced concrete. Um, and it, sort of a similar idea about this very kind of like rectilinear form. Um, in this case, this sort of uh, glacial excavation on the underside. Um, it was commissioned by a client actually wanted the space for his, he wanted a coffee table, but he also wanted something that his kids would enjoy. So he had these young children. Um, 
And this originally started a little bit bigger with the idea that you could actually crawl under some of these things. Um, at the end of the day, the kids ended up using it as a stage. So um, another, we get these great videos from people who uh, either uh, commission the work or enjoy it, but it was a video of his kid literally like dancing on top of this uh, heavy, super heavy, uh, relatively expensive uh, <laughs> platform. Um, this is a public artwork that we made in Miami uh, in 2012, it opened. Uh, it's at the Miami Orange Bowl, or sh I should say the former site of the Miami Orange Bowl, um, which is a very sort of culturally and historically significant building in Miami. It existed from the 30s as the home for the uh, Miami Hurricanes and a number of other sort of, Kennedy spoke there, Churchill spoke, everyone was, uh, sort of came there when they came to town. Um, this is what happened to it in 2007. Uh, they tore it down to build a new baseball stadium. So out of that, uh, this is the new stadium. Um, out of this, uh, for us at least, and I hope for the people of Miami, the po one very positive thing is uh, that there were a series of public artworks commissioned, one of them uh, being this project that we did for this west, pl or sorry, east plaza of the stadium, which is here in red. Um, so this is about like six, 700 feet long by about 80 feet wide. Um, and I'm just gonna go back here. So this was really the starting point for this project. Um, they wanted a sculptural sort of environment and um, we were interested in, um, as we often are, finding these things that belong to the existing architecture or the existing site. In this case, sort of going back in time and finding these, um, sort of physical recollections as relics that sort of suggest memories of the past site. So we took these letters, the Miami Orange Bowl sign, um, and proposed placing them into this plaza at their full uh, original scale. Um, but rather than sort of spelling out Miami Orange Bowl again, uh, we wanted them to sort of not spell anything and also create this sort of anagram game so that as you move around it st sort of starts to spell uh, different letters and also they wouldn't be fixed to a building and they wouldn't even be upright uh, They would be sort of scattered about as if they had either fallen from the past stadium or if they were being sort of uncovered and discovered um, So they're made from reinforced concrete um, And they're 15 feet tall uh, And they're kind of positioned as you can see these are just photos from them being made in a number of different configurations and intersecting with these different moments and architectural conditions in the site so this is what uh, they look like. And that's how big they are. Um, you wanna go? Sure. Um, Lift, another wonderful inflated project, um, was for New Museum um, Gala. Uh, this we created a grid out of these large inflated spheres. Um, there's some kind of project studies here. Um, and the idea is that this would be something a little more interactive. And here um, kind of tests, here we, we have it uh, fastened to a, a snarkitect um, for doing tests. Um, and then for this event, uh, the idea, we made this kind of grid, and instead of these being in a shape and then um, being static, we kind of coordinated with um, a set of performers that each, at the, the tethered end of each of these spheres uh, was a performer and there was music throughout the night, and choreographed these moments where the spheres would move um, and reconfigure um, over the course of the entire evening to make kind of new shapes, new spatial configurations. Um, again, something that probably needs a movie in this presentation. Um, so for us, oh, what's um, interesting about this is the possibility or suggestion that architect the actually making the architecture perform and not in a technical or sort of performative architecture uh, method, but in a way that's very uh, lo-fi and kind of uh, very directly connected to uh, the idea of uh, person and performance. So um, there was also this sort of um, juxtaposition that for us was very interesting, which were these sort of performance artists that we hired to actually perform the piece um, standing literally like back to back with, uh, this was the New Museum's Gala, so very sort of 
people who had paid a lot of money to be at these tables. And there was this kind of like high-low interaction that um, was very interesting to us. And also this kind of uh, anticipatory or unknown uh, sort of moment where you the guests came in and um, the space was quite low, like this sort of like compressed ceiling, almost like a drop ceiling, the spheres having this kind of uh, heavy presence over you. And uh, after some time, they s sort of slowly start to begin to rise up and uh, l literally lift the space. Yeah, I think most importantly about this and just using inflated spheres, uh, I guess this compared to say, um, the, the Miami project is that the scale and just the density and volume of this uh, piece in the space and that we had the chance to kind of make something like low and change throughout the evening, um, but really just always having this huge volumetric presence in the space. This is a chocolate bar. Um, so again, t not necessarily always architectural in scale, but um, we collaborated with a company from San Francisco called Dandelion, uh, who normally make very nice, sort of normal looking chocolate bars. And what we were interested in is basically making something that looked broken, like the idea of taking a chocolate bar that you would normally get intact um, and having this feeling that it's uh, something's not quite uh, correct about it. So these two halves actually fit together and sort of create a puzzle piece uh, of chocolate. Um, this is architectural sort of, um, interventions uh, for us blurring this boundary between objects and architecture, in this case a mirror, two mirrors uh, that are paired, uh, the one on the right being sort of a positive uh, topographic form and the one on the left being a negative um, imprint of that or however you wanna read it, whether one's being pulled out of the other or the other is being pushed in to create uh, the negative, but this literally cuts into uh, an, a wall. Uh, and so at the back of this wall is this sort of mirror that's being revealed as the sort of topographic layers are stepping back. Um, this is something we've been talking a lot about in the workshop that we're doing with uh, Scott in the 3D studio, um, is this idea of familiar and extraordinary. So taking uh, things that, whether it's architecture or objects, things that we know from our everyday experience and reimagining them uh, into something that is unknown uh, or less familiar. And this project is called Marble Run, and, and in this situation, you know, familiar um, also has an element of play for us that's not just familiar everyday objects like tools that we use, but also things, and in this case, uh, Marble Run, the kind of classic uh, kid's toy, that familiar is something you're so used to that it's more of a memory and that not something that maybe you see every day, but there's such a recall on some of these things that maybe you had it as a child or just know what it is because of its um, you know, kind of ubiquitous um, I don't know, situation of being a toy. Um, this situation, we actually purchased um, 50, I think, 50 some sets of marble runs, um, you know, the multicolored primary color toys, uh, and this reduced them all um, to white and created this whole kind of Marble Run Mountain for, um, this was in the lobby of the Delano in Miami. And we had 5,000 some black marbles on a mirror. Um, so if you kind of got up close to it, there was this kind of infinity, infinite Marble Mountain moment. Um, but still all you know usable, um, we invited guests to come and play the toy. And so kind of for a few days, a week, you heard the kind of clinking of the pinwheels of uh, marble runs, uh, kind of continuous, which for the most part people were polite with until kind of the end of the day, evening time, when there were handfuls of marbles being kind of thrown into it and it uh, survived pretty well, actually, considering. This is an ornament. Um, it's basically, again, taking this idea of A, a familiar ornament, and B, this sort of uh, iconic sort of snowman form. And in this case, it simply uh, appears to be melting. Um, we'll look at a couple other pieces later that use a similar idea. This is sort of, um, again, a 
taking something that is familiar in this case, uh, although it's uh, invisible because we've removed it, uh, we were asked by Cartel to reimagine uh, this bougie la the bougie lamp, um, this sort of well-known kind of uh, Baroque uh, plastic lamp. Um, in this case, we just draped it. So we created this uh, like as if the lamp had been in storage or unused um, and removed the lamp from the equation. So the only thing that's left is this kind of rigid shell, uh, which again appears as this kind of soft uh, body, but is in fact completely hard and sort of self-supporting, self-structural. Um, this is a piece called Pour. Um, In this case, we're taking this sort of uh, the form, the idea of a stool, the idea of a table, something that is sort of a recognizable framework and breaking it. So it's, it's been uh, sort of uh, bent or canted. And in infill, uh, this sort of piece of hand carved marble is sort of restoring the function of the piece, um, but also it's sort of threatening to pour outward from it. Um, and it's sort of a high contrast between this deep uh, wire brushed oak uh, base and the sort of smooth satin uh, calicotta marble infill. Um, Odin is a project that we did a couple years ago, a uh, temporary retail environment um, for Odin's fragrance line. So the fragrances um, in this case look like this, except that these are a replica version. So the original bottle you can see here on the left, um, and what we proposed and what we did was to replace that bottle, uh, or rather to supplement it with these thousands of cast replicas. Um, taking the original, this sort of very dark, uh, reflective, well I should say reflective versus matte, the cap of it, and turning it into this completely uniform, homogeneous matte white object. Um, this is a study for one of the displays here on the right. Um, and so we put about 10,000 of these into this very small space, uh, which was this sort of white, or rather a container that we had transformed into this all white environment. Um, this is the plan for it. This is what it looked like. Um, so you're seeing an all kind of white on white envi environment with the only uh, sort of quote unquote real or colored object being the actual product. Um, in this case, these uh, fragrance bottles. So there's a sort of a display that they're sitting on below, a uh, canopy that they're hanging from above. Uh, this is looking down into this sort of base display. Um, and the ceiling kind of creates this wave that comes down uh, to a point where you physically can't move any further into the space unless you're a small child. And from the floor, this sort of wave comes up uh, so that the view from the front sort of shows both of these things. Um, Kith is a retail project that we did um, which takes some of the earlier ideas that we were thinking about in these temporary environments and uh, puts it into this permanent uh, flagship space, which opened recently in Manhattan um, for a streetwear label called Kith. Um, there's sort of, uh, the store is organized around this sort of series of collections that um, the label has. But uh, for us, the sort of two critical moments that we focused on, one is uh, an installation on one of the walls that uses pencils. Uh, these are some sort of early studies for that. And this is what uh, this turned into, uh, which is 40,000 pencils um, sort of put into this custom perforated grid. Um, and the second is this uh, shoes. Uh, we were interested in creating a sort of a signature moment at the entrance of the store. Uh, that would be something that would both ca captivate from the street, so grab people's attention and also be um, kind of the memorable experience as they left. Uh, in this case, we asked the client what uh, who happens to be a uh, sort of well-known and uh, significant figure in sneaker culture. Uh, so we asked what his favorite sneaker was. Um, and on the left here is a pair of 1985 uh, Jordan 1s, uh, which we had to track down and then destroy uh, in order to create this version on the right, which is, again, this idea of a cast replica, taking something that's familiar and bringing it into the space where um, it's a little bit unclear it is, if it's real, what it's made from, how it exists. Um, these shoes were then multiplied, so there's about 500 of them that hang from uh, the ceiling and the entrance of the store. We'll see it again in a moment here. And then this is back to the pencil wall here. So we're having uh, this gradient that's sort of shifting from uh, light to dark as it moves up the wall. Um, and Everything's secured except for the lowest pencils. All the white pencils are loose, and so there's um, this kind of uh, invitation to steal them, basically. Um, 
which every time I go in there, they're never gone. But I think it's because they keep getting replaced. This is looking up into this wall. I think in this project too, um, just like the the Jordan ones that, like fitting in with the others, you know, there's a multiplicity that happens to get from the familiar to the extraordinary, and this kind of reduction um, going to all white. But with the pencils and even the the vitrines in this space that have this kind of um, uh, I don't know hyperbolic feel to them, a hyperbolic chamber um, that there's this kind of in casting something and kind of creating this piece that it's kind of a sense that there's a, a foreverness to it. Um, but then the mul multiplicity um, combination kind of creates another kind of extraordinary situation. Um, this is a series of initial studies for a product that we made called Cast Light, which um, took the sort of a light bulb, um, what could be more kind of familiar to our everyday environment. And in this case, instead of um, producing a light fixture that you screwed the light bulb into, we cast the light fixture around the bulb. So it's actually really the way we thought about it is a light bulb. Um, it happens to have this sort of self-incorporated fixture, but uh, the lights could never be removed. They were LED, long life LED bulbs. So um, this was like a major concern for people that they were asked to pay the money for something that they couldn't replace. Um, so, so far we've never had one burn out. They last, you know, whether you burn it all day and it's gonna last 10 years or you burn it a few hours a day, it's gonna last 40 years. Um, we ended up sort of reducing this to one of these, but this was an initial series of studies about uh, how you could excavate or remove material from this cube to allow this bulb, which had been concealed inside, to sort of start to allow light to come out. A um, little bit of a similar um, concept, except this time starting with the, familiar, the idea of a familiar uh, light fixture. There was a series of these, in this case, this sort of um, conical uh, pendant light. Um, and here we're excavating from the outside and also this kind of uh, f space within, within uh, this sort of uh, topographic form. Uh, and with the light source inside that's obviously coming out from the bottom, but also from these kind of moments on the side. Um, and these materials were made from felt, uh, like 100% wool felt that was just uh, cut and stacked. Um, this is kind of the last sort of thematic we'll talk about, which is this idea of wonder and interaction. Um, some of the other projects spoke to this, but the concept of play and engagement uh, are very important to us. The idea of someone's experience as they're approaching and entering and uh, walking through our work, uh, that they're finding these things that speak to them directly. Um, for us, we're making work that has a very wide appeal, uh, or this is like one of our goals. Is, um, Oftentimes when we're approaching a project, we're thinking about uh, sort of the perspective of a child, uh, how uh, children sort of think about architecture and how they engage with our everyday surroundings. Um, the idea that sort of anything becomes a platform or an opportunity for play. Um, and we see play as a sort of uh, one of the more significant kinds of interaction that can happen with architecture. Um, in this case, this kind of uh, wonder from this piece, which is a pillow. Um, there's a couple different versions of this, but there are all these cast forms that are completely solid, a little bit heavy, um, but suggest a sort of a soft form. Um, these also are objects that we started because we're interested in these things that perform single, very rudimentary functions. In this case, something that holds your phone, something that holds your keys, uh, the idea that you can't lose these things if you know where they are. Um, this was an expanded version of this, uh, which we made for Beats, which was uh, we took their headphones and completely stripped them down, like we removed every single bit of color and branding from them, um, and then paired them with this larger version of the pillow, um, which is made from cultured marble. So you have this thing that when the headphones are removed feels uh, like an actual soft pillow, uh, and uh, when you pick it up, it has the weight of a piece of marble. You want to talk about this one? Sure. Um, Public School is a, a brand, and we did their fashion show. This is last spring, fall. Mm -hmm. um, and essentially, um, on a shoestring budget, it was like, how do we max out and get the most interactive uh, runway show of that year? And the answer was obviously a ton of confetti. Um, and what we did was create these zones where we piled up the confetti before the show and included putting them on people's seats. 
And once the public came in, they had to you know, make a decision of where do I sit or do I push this stuff off? Do I walk through it and you know, tiptoe around it to keep it kind of perfect? Um, so it starts to blur, but then as the show kind of goes on, uh, you know, everything just really kind of falls apart and people can get more comfortable with it. And you know, Confendi ended up everywhere, um, which then everywhere included going to the party afterwards where it was all delivered and dumped on everyone. Um, this is a project we recently did in New York. Uh, it was at the Calvin Klein flagship on Madison. Um, we were asked to make these holiday windows, um, which for us was uh, the most interesting part of this is the kind of traditional aspect of holiday windows, especially on Madison or Fifth in New York. Um, and so we really took this uh, idea about uh, creating a moment of wonder, and this also speaks a little bit to the idea of something that's familiar and from your past, um, in this case, this model train. So here we're seeing this little mock-up in our studio. Um, but putting it into this uh, environment, uh, which was already a fairly minimal environment, but uh, we basically made the windows a little bit more minimal. Um, the landscape that the trains run through is this uh, sort of topography or drift that's made from these fiberglass rods uh, varying lengths and this all black monochromatic train uh, that runs through them sort of has this uh, interactive uh, multi-level um, going through walls coming closer to the window disappearing kind of approach um, so again a mix of uh, something that is almost like a toy and it definitely recalls something from uh, well a certain generation's past um, but uh, there were these moments where you get uh, like child and uh, like grandparent together and they're both sort of having different reactions to the same um, environment um, and something that really also in high contrast to everything else that's happened uh, there's so many things about holiday that are about either uh, like glitz or kitsch or these sort of like louder more um, uh, in your face kind of moments and this was uh, an opportunity for us to kind of create a little bit of serenity uh, around the holiday. Um, this is a super simple piece that's just a coaster. Um, and it typically, it generally looks like a pretty ordinary concrete cylinder uh, or disc. Um, it has a very subtle slope to it. So a similar idea to the brake um, cabinet that we looked at earlier. Um, only until you use the object or interact with it do you understand this sort of suggestion or implication of slippage or spillage. Um, but again, uh, designed to actually not do any of those things. similar idea here. Um, the piece, again, the framework of this bench, this black piece uh, being sort of destroyed or uh, having its function negated by uh, suggesting, su suggesting this kind of rotation um, and sort of sinking, and this kind of white volume on the right restoring that program. You want to run something? Yeah. So Airball uh, is a project. We just did this December, um, again, for Art Basel. They're in 1111 Lincoln is this parking garage you may or may not be familiar with. This Herzog Demeron parking garage, and on the fourth floor is the store Alchemist. Um, and they invite us to come do this uh, installation in front of their store, um, which, you know, again, we want to play with these moments of wonder and these, you know, familiar um, things that are familiar to us as maybe as kids, like the holiday windows or the marble run, but in this case, um, arcades and the kind of feel of going to sporting events. Um, there it is. Building, there's our site. This is the store here, so our site's up in the front. Um, there you go. Um, so what we did is got actually to um, Hoop Fever, if you're familiar with uh, arcade basketball, uh, to Hoop Fever games, uh, again, reduce them to these all-white um, versions of themselves, and created these uh, bandstands, so you had this moment uh, to kind of walk through, like walking into, let's see, walking into a stadium and coming out um, onto the court, and they were hooked up so you can kind of play against each other. Um, we created this using um, like the basketball racks from you know gym class or from the Y, uh, and then this case turned into a bit of a abacus of these reduced 
all white um, basketballs, which got tagged, I think, day one um, by somebody you can see up here. But here's the kind of the pass through um, onto the court, into the stadium. And luckily we were able to salvage one and now it's in Greenpoint if anyone wants to visit and play a little hoop fever with us. So one of the goals here in addition to creating this kind of um, environment for Alchemist uh, during Art Basel um, was to turn it from something that's uh, more, like it wasn't just something to look at and it wasn't just something to walk through, but it was really designed to be a social space, um, a space where people would come and actually hang out um, and play. Uh, which, uh, and it was also, both this and the Marble Run for us were, uh, in the context of Art Basel, very interesting projects. They were both open all week. They were both free, open to the public. Uh, so there were things that, um, whether you were a design collector or whether you were a kid from Miami who wanted to just see some stuff and uh, experience uh, a little design or architectural moment, um, it was accessible for everyone. Uh, white Patterns um, is a stage design that we did in collaboration with a choreographer named Jonah Beaucaire. Um, working within the relatively limited budget of uh, contemporary dance, uh, we looked to ping pong balls uh, to create the entire set for this piece, um, which in turn, in building this work with Jonah, became actually a very like important conceptual device in the performance. So it's designed around the series of games that occur in this sort of court that we're creating. Um, so throughout here, we're seeing this sort of frame being broken down over the course of the performance. And these moments of uh, where the balls are being introduced without um, notice. And so for the dance audience, who's sort of this captive audience, to have thousands of ping pong balls sort of raining down from above or spilling in from the side um, become this sort of like uh, element of wonder that happens during the performance. Um, I think this is the last image, but this is a recent object that we made that's um, a candle. And inside of each of these, this is the first part of the series that we're doing in New based around New York. Um, but inside of each of the candles is a souvenir. So as the candle burns down, you sort of get this building uh, or monument that becomes revealed. Uh, the lower the candle gets, the more building you see. Um, and when you get this, it's just a complete, you know, a white cylinder of wax. So it's a little bit of like a you know, a kinder egg or the sort of, you're not sure what you're gonna get until you actually burn down. And that's it. Um, thank you.